Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we are covering chapter 13 of biology and this chapter is about meiosis and sexual life cycles. Now as the title suggests, meiosis is a really big part of this chapter. In short, meiosis is a special type of cell division that produces cells with half the chromosomes of the parent cell. It only occurs in specialized cells, cells like the, those found in the testes and ovaries in humans. But of course, it's more than just understanding that. There are several objectives that we want to understand and cover here that will really help us conceptualize and begin to understand meiosis and sexual life cycles and how genetic variability arises from these processes. So these are the following points that we're really going to try to hone in on in this video. First, objective. Offsprings acquire genes from parents by inheriting chromosomes. Second objective that we're, we're going to um, elaborate on is that fertilization and meiosis alternate in sexual life cycles. Objective three is that meiosis reduces the number of chromosomes set from diploid to haploid. And four, we'll end this chapter with a conversation about genetic variation produced in sexual life cycles and how they contribute to evolution. Now, let, now let's start by really motivating this chapter's objectives that we're going to you know, spend some time covering one by one. You know, friends might tell you that you have your mother's nose or your father's eyes, although they don't mean that literally, of course. And that's because the transmission of traits from one generation to the next is called inheritance or hereditary. At the same time, sons and daughters, they're not identical copies of either parents or their siblings. Along with inherited similarity, there's also variation. So while you might inherit your mother's freckles or your father's eye colors, you are not an exact copy of either of them and neither are your siblings. And this is because of variation. The study of both hereditary and inherited variation is called genetics. And that's kind of what we're starting a little bit about um, talking about in this chapter and even a couple of following chapters we're really focusing on the genetics now with that said let's start let's let's take a quick overview of of this infograph here that shows us um quickly meiosis it defines a, it defines it it asks what biological mechanisms account for the resemblance between offsprings and their parents. And while we stated a little bit of that, the point of covering these objects is so that this infographic makes a lot more sense by the end of the chapter. We're going to see something similar at the end after we've covered the details, and then we'll be able to retouch base and see how this makes more sense. With that being said, first objective. All right, offsprings acquire genes from parents by inheriting chromosomes. Parents endow their offsprings with coded information in the form of hereditary units called genes. All right, hereditary units called genes. The genes we inherit from our mothers and our fathers are our genetic link to our parents. And they account for family resemblances like shared eye color or freckles or specific shape of nose, etc. Our genes program those specific traits that emerge as we developed from fertilized egg into adults. And the genetic program is written in the language of DNA, which we're gonna talk about here. We're going to cover it in great detail in the next few chapters, but we also have been introduced to when we've talked about nucle nucleotides and nucleic acids previously. But what we should know is this, all right? What we should know is that the transmission of hereditary traits has its molecular basis in the replication of DNA, which is going to produce copies of genes that then can be passed from parent to offspring. In animals and, and plants, reproductive cells are going to be called gametes, and they are vehicles that transmit genes from one generation 
into the next. Now, during fertilization, male and female gametes, the sperm and the egg, unite, all right? And they unite, and in that process, they are passing on genes from both of the parents, from that sperm and egg to their offspring, all right? Every species has a characteristic number of chromosomes. So let's take Let's take us as an example, us human beings, right? Humans have 46 chromosomes in their somatic cells. And what somatic cells means is all the cells of the body except the gametes and their precursors. Each chromosome is going to consist of a single long DNA molecule that's elaborately coiled in, associ in association with various proteins like histines, like we've covered previously. Now, one chromosome just one chromosome, all right, is going to include, all right, several hundreds to a few thousands to a few thousand genes, each gene being a precise sequence of nucleotides along the DNA molecule. And a gene-specific location along the chromosome is called the gene's locus. Now, something else that's worth mentioning and talking about, now that we've set up how offsprings acquire genes from parents by inheriting chromosomes, right? We have the, you know, the sperm and egg, when they unite, they pass on genes of both parents to their offspring, all right? Well, something else that's worth mentioning and talking about is the difference between sexual and asexual reproduction. I made mention about how you might have, you know, the same nose as your mother or the same eye color as your father, but you are not an identical replication of either of them. And that's because humans partic participate in sexual reproduction. On the opposite end of that is asexual reproduction. Only organisms that reproduce asexually have offsprings that are exact copies of themselves. In asexual reproduction, a single individual is the sole parent, all right? And they will pass copies of all their genes to the offspring without the fuss and the fusion of gametes. On, in sexual reproduction, on the other hand, right? So that was asexual reproduction, all right? It's pretty much like cloning, right? You can think of it like cloning. All right, sexual reproduction, on the other hand, right? You have two parents that give rise to offsprings that have unique combinations of genes inherited from both of them, all right? So in contrast to this cloning of asexual reproduction, offsprings of sexual reproduction are gonna vary genetically, all right? From their parents, from their siblings, all right? They are variations, all right? of common themes of family resemblance, but they are not exact replicas, right? Now, sexual or asexual reproduction, all right, a life cycle is the generation to generation sequence of stages in the reproductive history of an organism. And that's kind of what we want to slowly begin to transition into, but very quickly, takeaways from our first objective. Offsprings acquire genes from parents by inher inheriting chromosomes. The takeaway here is that each gene in an organism's DNA exists at a specific locus on a certain chromosome. In asexual reproduction, single parent produces genetically identical offspring by mitosis. But on, in sexual reproduction, you're going to combine genes from two parents and that's going to lead to genetically diverse offsprings. All right, let's talk about our second objective now. All right, fertilization and meiosis alternate in sexual life cycles, right? A life cycle is, like we said, the generation to generation sequence of stages in the reproductive history of an organism. This is from conception to production, all right? Now, for this objective, let's start by using humans as an example to track the behavior of chromosomes through the sexual life cycle, right? We're gonna begin by considering the chromosome count in human somatic cells and human gamete cells, all right? In humans, each somatic cell, 
All right, so that's all the cells besides your gametes, besides, you know, the, the cells in your ovaries and testes, all right? Those are somatic cells. They all have 46 chromosomes. Before mitosis begins, the chromosomes are duplicated. Then, during mitosis, those chromosomes become condensed enough to be visible, all right, under, under a light microscope, all right, not to the naked eye. <laughs> and then at this point, okay, they can be distinguished under the microscope from one another by their size, the position of their centromeres, the patterns of colored bands produced by certain chromatin binding stains, etc. All right, now careful examination, right, of the 46 human cells from, say, a single cell in mitosis shows you that there are two chromosomes of each 23 types. And this becomes really clear, all right? This becomes clear when images of the chromosomes are arranged in pairs, starting with the longest chromosomes, all right? And this resulting order of the 23 types of chromosomes, all right, of which there are two copies of each, all right? In this kind of display that we see here is called a karyotype. All right, so notice we have 23 pairs. All right, this is 22. This is 23 pairs, all right, of chromosomes. All right, in each pair, there's two, right? So total of 46, all right, 23 pairs. That means these are copies of each other, essentially, all right? There are two copies of a type. So the resulting ordered display here is called a karyotype. The two chromosomes of a pair, all right, they're going to have the same length, the same centromere position, and the same staining pattern. And so what we call this pair, all right, of chromosomes, this pair of chromosomes that have the same property, same length, centromere position, etc., these are called homologs, all right? They are homologous chromosomes, all right? So either of this terminology being used to discuss this means the same thing, homologs, homologous chromosomes, all right? Both chromosomes of each pair carry genes controlling the same inherited character, all right? The same inherited characters. For example, if a gene for eye color is situated at a particular locus, all right, on a certain chromosome, right there, all right, then its homologous chromosome, its, homo, its homolog is going to have the same, it will have a version of the eye color gene at the equivalent locus, all right? That doesn't mean they both have necessarily the gene for blue eyes, but the gene for eye color is in the same location for these two homologous chromosomes. All right, so that's what that means. That there's a very important distinction here to be made between those two statements. All right, now, what you notice also is here at the end, we have this, instead of numbering it 23, this XY pair, all right? The two chromosomes referred to as X and Y are going to be important exceptions to the general pattern of homologous chromosomes in um, human somatic cells. Now, typically, human females will have a homologous pair of X chromosomes, so they'll have XX, while males have one X and Y one chromosome. Of course, there's exceptions to this variation as well. That's probably gonna be a topic for later chapters. Now, most of the genes carried on the X chromosome, they do not have counterparts on the tiny Y chromosome. All right, and the Y chromosome has genes lacking on the X. And so due to their role in sex determination, the X and Y chromosomes, they're called sex chromosomes. All right, so these have a specific name, this XY, this 23rd pair of chromosomes, they're called sex chromosomes. Every other pair of chromosomes, one through 22, those are called autosomes. All right, that's spelled like this, autosomes. All right, that's gonna be pair one through 23 of this parent. All right, fantastic. So 
Homologs, homologous chromosomes, defined as chromosomes with the same length, same centromere, and gene location. All right, fantastic. See how these have the same length? All right, they have the same gene location. Let's pretend that's the gene for eye color, right? Look at them, they're at the same location. They could both be for the genes for blue eyes. One could be blue, one can be brown. It doesn't matter. It's just that it's the same gene identification location, all right? Um, and so that's just, I had to repeat it. It is an important distinction to be able to make. Now, the occurrence of pairs of homologous chromosomes in each human somatic cell. It's a consequence of our sexual origin. We inherit one chromosome of a pair from each parent. So that means the, 20, the 46 chromosomes in our somatic cells are actually two sets of 23 chromosomes. All right, a maternal set of 23 chromosomes and a paternal set of 23 chromosomes. All right, so let me repeat that. 46 chromosomes in our somatic cells are actually two sets of 23 chromosomes, a maternal set from our mother and a paternal set from our father. All right, the number of chromosomes in a single set is then represented by the letter N. All right, any cell with two chromosome sets is called a diploid cell, and it has a diploid number of chromosomes. And so it can be abbreviated as 2N. Now we said our somatic cells, all right, so every cell in our body except our gametes, they're gonna have 2N number of chromosomes. They're gonna have two sets of 23 chromosomes for a total of 46 chromosomes in those somatic cells, all right? And so what do we call somatic cells? How do we describe them? We use the word diploid cell. Right? because it has a diploid number of chromosomes. All right. Unlike somatic cells, our gametes, they can they 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 consist, all right, of they contain a single set of chromosomes. All right, they only contain one set of chromosomes, so they only have n chromosomes. All right. So our gametes have 20 our gamete cells have 23 chromosomes. We call that haploid. All right, a haploid cell. A, a haploid set all right because these gametes they only have 23 chromosomes they have n whereas our diploid has two n chromosomes so that's another way to distinguish that fantastic all right so that's how we can define diploid cell has a has two complete sets of chromosomes most cells in humans are diploid comprising of 23 chromosome pairs so 46 chromosomes in to total Haploid refers to the presence of a single set of chromosomes in an organism cell. In humans, only the egg and sperm cells are haploid. Now, the human cycle. The human cycle begins when a haploid sperm from the father fuses with a haploid egg from the mother. And this union of gametes, cultivating in, in the fusion of their nuclei, all right, when they, when they combine, when they come together, is called fertilization. All right, the resulting fertilized egg is also called a zygote, zygo, by the way. It's diploid now because it contains two haploid cells of chromosomes bearing genes that represent the maternal family line and the paternal family line, right? They have chromosomes from both the mom and the dad. Now, as the human develops into a sexually maturing adult, Mitosis of the zygote and its descendant cells um, generates all the somatic cells of the body, right? Both chromosome sets in the zygote and all the genes they carry are passed with precision to the somatic cells. The only cells of the human body that are not produced by mitosis are, again, the gametes, which develop from specialized cells called germ cells in the gonads. That's gonna be ovaries in females and testes in males. All right, so the fertilization of egg and sperm creates a diploid zygote, all right, which from there um, produces and generates all the somatic cells of your body. And of course, from your germ cells in the gonads, all right, you develop those, those um, gamete cells that are haploid. Now, gamete formation, specifically, 
involves a type of cell division called meiosis. All right, this type of cell division reduces the number of sets of chromosomes from two in the parent cell to one in each gamete. All right, and that kind of counterbalances the doubling that occurs at fertilization. All right, so as a result of meiosis, each human sperm and egg is then a haploid. All right, fertilization restores the diploid condition, right? So you have this woman who's all of her cells are somatic. They have 46 chromosomes except for her, her ovaries, her gametes. All right, same thing for the man. All right, and then his sperm and her egg unite, <laughs> all right? And they now form a diploid zygote, all right? So this fertilization of gametes, you know, the egg from the women, the sperm from the man, restores that diploid condition by combining two sets of chromosomes. And the human life cycle is repeated that way, generation after generation, all right? Now, just as a little bit of a side note, we're not going to get into this too much, but although the alternation of meiosis and fertilization is common to all organisms that reproduce sexually, the timing of these two events in the life cycle varies depending on the species. Now, we're not going to worry too much about the life cycle of plants, algae, or fungi, but, or fungi, but what we do need to know is the following. The common feature of all three cycles is that alternation of meiosis and fertilization, key events that contribute to genetic variation among offsprings. And the cycle differs in the timing of these two events, depending on whether you're talking about plants, algae, or fungi. All right, there is great variety of sexual life cycles. That's the takeaway. And I guess a bit of a summary of all the objectives of all the points that we've covered in objective two now, all right, we've discussed that normal human hu uh, somatic cells are diploid. They have 46 chromosomes, all right, that are made out of two sets of 23 chromosomes, one set from each parent. Human diploid cells have 22 pairs of homolo uh, uh, homologs that are autosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes, all right, the latter typically determines whether the person is female or male. In humans, ovaries and testes, they produce haploid ga uh, gametes by, meio by meiosis, each gamete containing a single set of 23 chromosomes. Now, during fertilization, an egg and a sperm unite, ignore that, forming a multicellular, uh, forming a diploid single cell zygote, which develops into a multicellular organism by mitosis, all right? And of course, the last point that we've made mention of is that sexual life cycles differ in the timing of meiosis relative to fertilization and in the points of the cycle at which multicellular organism is produced by mitosis, all right? With that, we move into our third objective, meiosis, all right? Meiosis reduces the number of chromosome sets from diploid to haploid. Here we're going to cover and go over a lot of the details of meiosis, and we're even going to compare it to mitosis, which was the topic of last chapter. Now, several steps of meiosis closely resemble corresponding steps in mitosis. Meiosis, very much like mitosis, is preceded by interphase, which includes a S phase, where the duplication of chromosomes happen. However, the difference is that this is not followed by one, but two consecutive cell divisions in meiosis, called meiosis one and meiosis two. And these two divisions result in four daughter cells, all right, as opposed to mitosis, which resulted in two daughter cells. All right, and in meiosis, those four daughter cells each have only half as many chromosomes as the parent cell. So they have one set rather than two. All right. Now, some quick reminders of some very important definitions, right? I just want to make sure that we remind ourselves of some of the vocabulary used here. I know we covered it in mitosis, still important to cover here because 
understanding that vocabulary will make understanding the steps of meiosis a lot easier, all right? So if you recall, um, one definition we want to go over is sister chromatids, right? Sister chromatids are copies of one chromosome, all right? So notice here, here, you have two chromosomes, and they're a pair of homologous chromosomes in a diploid parent cell. So this cell has 46 chromosomes total, all right? Two sets of 23, all right? These are homologous chromosomes in that diploid cell. Remember what that means. They're going to have the same length, position of centromeres, same staining. They're going to have the same locus for the same gene. All right. They're going to duplicate. All right. These chromosomes are going to duplicate. So now this guy duplicates himself. All right. And this, this, this guy duplicates himself. Now what we have is two identical copies of this one chromosome. All right. And we call them sister chromatids. So this is these two these two chromosomes are sister chromatids. All right. Now, these right here were homologous pairs. They duplicated. This is a sister chromatid. They are still homologous chromosomes. All right. They've just duplicated themselves and attached themselves to their sister chromatids. All right. So that's one important def definition to remember. Sister chromatids are two copies of one chromosome, closely associated all along their length. This association is called a sister chromatid cohesion. Together, the sister chromatids make up one duplicated chromosome. So this is a chromosome. This is a duplicated chromosome. All right. The duplicated chromosomes are still homologous chromosomes. All right. Now, in contrast, right, the two chromosomes of a homologous pair are individual chromosomes that were inherited from each parent. So this may be mom's chromosome and this may be dad's. All right. They're not duplicated copies of each other. They're just a homologous pair. All right. That means they have similarities in things, again, like length, centromere position. All right. Location of gene. All right. On that length. So. Those are two distinctions I will continue to repeat because it is important to make that contrast, all right? Homologous pairs of individual, uh, homologous pair are individual chromosomes that were inherited from each parent. Homologs do appear alike in the microscope, but they can have different versions of genes at the corresponding locus, right? Each version is called an allele of that gene. Right? So you can have these two homologous chromosomes, one from mom, one from dad, and they both have the same location in that homologous chromosome for gene, for, for eye color, but one chromosome can have the blue color gene, the other one the brown color gene, right? So each version of is called an allele of that gene. Fantastic. Now, that, that was just two definitions I wanted to make sure we understood before we move into all the steps of meiosis, all right? Meiosis, like we said, is a specialized form of cell division that occurs in sexually reproducing organisms to produce gametes, to produce sex cells with half the number of chromosomes as the parent cell. It involves two consecutive rounds of division called me meiosis I and meiosis II. And we're going to go, um, we're going to read a summary of the key steps involved in meiosis. All right. Now, they have, we're going we're to do a quick summary and then we're going to read the details in this infographic. All right. And then we're going to repeat that again. Right. Repetition is key here. All right. Now, just like mitosis, there is an interface step first, right? The cell undergoes a period of growth and DNA replication that's going to result in the formation of identical sister chromatids. All right, then we start with prophase one. All right, let's read the bullet points here and then we're going to summarize it. All right, so prophase one, the centrosome movement, spindle formation, and nuclear envelope breakdown occurs as it does in mitosis. All right, and the chromosomes are going to condense progressively throughout prophase one. All right, also during early prophase one, each chromosome pairs with its homolog, all right, aligned gene by gene, and sometimes crossing over can happen. So parts of each homolog chromosome can just swap out places. We're going to talk about that even more in just a second. 
All right, so that means the DNA molecules of non-sister chromatids are broken by proteins and are rejoined to other. All right, now at the stage shown above, each homologous pair has one or more X-shaped region called um, chiasma, where crossovers have occurred. And then later in prophase one, microtubules from one pole or the other are going to attach to the kinetochores, one at the centromere of each homolog. All right, and microtubules are going to move the homologous pairs towards the metaphase plate. All right, so the summary here of prophase one is that your chromosomes are going to condense and your homologous chromosomes are going to pair up to form tetrads. All right, because they've already duplicated in the interphase, right? What you have now are these duplicated chromosomes and the, the duplicated uh, homologous chromosome as well. All right, they're going to pair up to form tetrads. This pairing process known as synapsis sometimes allows for the exchange of genetic material between non-sister chromatids, all right, so between homologous chromosomes, all right, and this is called crossing, crossing over. Then the nuclear envelope breaks down and the spindle apparatus begins to form, all right, and then we move into metaphase one. Pairs of homologous chromosomes, look at that, are now arranged at, a, at the metaphase plate. So here's a duplicated chromosome and its homologous duplicated chromosome pair. All right, and look at all of them. They're aligned on that metaphase plate in the center. All right, with one chromosome of each pair facing each pole, each pair has lined up independently of other pairs. All right, we're going to discuss the consequences of that later in independent assortment. All right, both chromatids of one homolog are attached to the kinetochore microtubules from one pole. All right, the chromatids of each homolog are attached to microtubules. Look at that, they're attached to these microtubules. One over here, one over here. All right, they're attached to each other from opposite poles. All right, so in metaphase one, these tetrads align along the cell's equator with each homologous chromosome attached to microtubules from opposite poles of the cell. Then we move into anaphase one, all right? Breakdown of proteins that are responsible for sister chromatid cohesion along chromatid arms allows homologs to separate. All right, so now each duplicated chromosome, all right, and its homologous pair, each one gets moved to the opposite side of the cell all right so homologous chromosomes are now separated all right the, ho the the homologs are going to move toward the opposite poles guided by those spindle apparatus sister chromatid cohesion persists at the centromere causing the two chromatids of each chromosome to move as a unit along the same pole notice sister chromatids are not broken they stay together but homologous pairs are separated now in anaphase one all right so you had these homologous chromosomes pair up at the metaphase, all right? But each one of the homologous chromosomes gets taken to opposite sides during anaphase one. So the two homologous chromosomes of each pair separate. All right, then there's telophase one and cytokinesis. Essentially two haploid cells form. Each chromosome still consists of two sister chromatids. So when telophase one begins, each half of the cell has a complete haploid set, set of du duplicated chromosomes. Each chromosome is con composed of two sister chromatids. One or both chromatids include, include regions of non-sister chromatid DNA because of that crossing over that happened in prophase one. And then cytokinesis happens. Um, which is the division of the cytoplasm to form two haploid daughter cells. All right, fantastic. So that is meiosis one. You had duplicated homologous chromosomes pair up and exchange some segments of, of, of each other to one another. All right, then the chromosomes, the homologous, the, the chromosomes line up by homologous pairs. That's metaphase one. In anaphase one, we had the two homologous chromosomes of each pair separate. And then in telophase one and cytokinesis, two haploid cells form. Each chromosome still consists of two sister chromatids. All right, so that is meiosis one. Then we can move into meiosis two. 
All right, here we're separating homologous chromosomes. Now we're going to be separating sister chromatids. All right, in prophase two, you're going to have spindle apparatus form. And in late prophase two, chromosomes, each still composed of two chromatids, are moved by microtubules towards the metaphase plate. All right. Then in metaphase two, your chromosomes are going to align at the equator of each daughter cell. All right. The chromosomes are positioned at the metaphase plate because of crossing over in meiosis one. The two sister chromatids of each chromosome are not genetically identical anymore. And the kinetic cores of sister chromatids are attached to microtubules that are extending from opposite poles. Then in anaphase two, sister chromatids are going to separate and move towards opposite poles of each daughter cell. All right. And then in telophase two, chromosomes reach the opposite poles, nuclear envelope forms around them, and then cytokinesis follows, resulting in the formation at the end of this of four haploid daughter cells. So the end result of meiosis is the production of four genetically unique haploid cells, gametes, in other words, from what we started off with, which was one diploid parent cell. These haploid cells can then fuse with other haploid cells during fertilization to restore the diploid chromosome number in the resulting offspring. All right, meiosis introduces genetic, um, a lot of genetic diversity. As you saw in prophase one, there's crossing over that happens. Um, in anaphase one, there's the possibility of what is called independent assortment of chromosomes, which we'll talk about later. And even the random fusion of gametes during fertilization, all that introduces genetic diversity. All right, but that is summary of meiosis, all right? Fantastic. Let me actually, before we even move on, let me restate this one more time. In meiosis one, we start off in the interphase. Everything has been duplicated already. Then starting off with prophase one, chromosomes condense. They pair up. Crossing over can happen between homologous chromosomes. This is where the first major source of genetic variation comes in. Then we have metaphase one, this guy right here. The tetrads are going to line up on the metaphase plate. Chromosomes line up by homologous pairs. Then we have anaphase one. All right, the homologous chromosomes separate and move towards opposite poles. And then telophase one and cytokinesis. Chromosomes are going to reach the poles. Nuclear membrane reforms and cell divides. Notice the two cells produced have half the number of chromosome as the parent cell. And with that, we move into meiosis two. We start off with prophase two. The nuclear envelope breaks down, chromosomes condense, and then in metaphase two, chromosomes line up again, uh, along the equator of each cell. Anaphase two, sister chromatids separate and they move towards opposite poles. Telophase two and cytokinesis, the chromosomes reach the poles. The nuclear membrane reforms and the cells divide again. At the end, we now have four haploid daughter cells containing half the number of chromosomes as the original parent cell, each with a unique combination of genes. All right, fantastic. Now, something else we want to discuss is kind of what makes genetic variability possible. Crossing over is one of those things, and we briefly mentioned that it happens in prophase one, but let's, let's talk about it, right? Crossing over is a process in which homologous chromosomes are going to exchange genetic material, all right? It occurs between non-sister chromatids of homologous chromosomes that have paired up during synapsis, and that exchange of genetic material is going to result in the recombination of alleles between those homologous chromosomes. So in the in meiosis one, right, we have these homologous pairs that have duplicated, all right? So this is one homologous pair, all right? I'm going to draw another one in a different color, all right? Another homologous pair right here, all right? We're going to highlight them in a different color too, all right? They've du duplicated, all right? One more. I just want to draw this out, okay? Cool. 
So we have these duplicated, now the, we have these homologous chromosomes, all right? These are homologous chromosomes, all right? Now, in, in one of these, all right, this was a duplicated chromosome that's now attached to its sister chromatid through sister chromatid cohesion, all right? What happens is that it's going to exchange some parts of this. Ooh, let me make that highlighter smaller. All right, some part of this sister chromatid is going to exchange with its homologous chromosome. All right, these are going to swap out. All right, when that happens, all right, these, these sister chromatids now, all right, let's, let's color in, let's erase, they've swapped. So now they have different parts all right, they, they, they are not what they started off with when they were duplicating, all right? Now, what, what's happening is that between the sister chromatids themselves, they are no longer identical, even though that when they were formed, when the sister chromatid pair was formed, this duplicated and attached itself to its sister chromatid through sister chromatid cohesion. But because of recombination between its homologous chromosome, the sister chromatids are no longer identical. This introduces genetic variation. The exchange of genetic ma ma material results in the recombination of alleles between the homologous chromosome, all right? The sister chromatids are no longer identical, duplicated version of each other, you know, cohesed together. And this process contributes to genetic diversity by shuffling and combining genetic information from both parents. So crossing over introduces genetic diversity. It's facilitated by the formation of protein structures called chiasm, uh, chiasmas or chiasmata for plural, which physically connect the homologous chromosomes at the points of chromosome uh, of, of the points of, of crossing over. So the homologous pairs actually get really close. All right, and these two parts right here are, are so close that they can swap out now. All right, and so that's how crossing over happens. Now, synapsis is the pairing of those homologous chromosomes during prophase one of meiosis. All right, so together, oh, let me, let me elaborate on that. Synapsis, right, we said is the pairing of homologous chromosomes during prophase one of meiosis. Homologous chromosomes, one inherited from each parent, they align closely, become connected along their length, all right, the paired chromosome form a structure called the tetrad, which we mentioned right over here. When we have homologous chromosomes aligned next to each other, they form what is called a tetrad. All right, within this tetrad, they are held, these homologous chromosomes are held together by protein complexes, and these complexes facilitate the alignment and stabilization of the paired chromosomes during crossing over. So the synapsis allows for accurate alignment of homologous chromosomes, ensures that crossing over occurs between the correct chromosomes. So that's how crossing over becomes possible. It's through the proper alignment and, can, and, and closely, close connection between the homologous chromosomes. All right, and that ultimately plays a role in genetic diversity. So here's another way that you can, you can see that, right? sister chromatids there's crossing over that happens in between and so now um, different parts of the homologous chromosomes are exchanged fantastic one more thing that is important is let us compare and contrast mitosis and meiosis now there are three events all right this is a really great um, visual representation to help you see the differences between mitosis and meiosis, but there are three events that are unique to meiosis um, that are, are gonna occur during meiosis one, actually, all right? That, that creates one of the biggest differences between mitosis and meiosis, all right? First thing is synapsis and crossing over. So during meiosis, specifically prophase one, duplicated homologs are gonna pair up, crossing over occurs, all right, and what 
you notice is that synapses and crossing over do not occur during prophase of mitosis. So that's our first different difference between mitosis and meiosis. Second difference between mitosis and meiosis is the alignment of homologous pairs at the metaphase plate. So at metaphase one of meiosis, pairs of homologs are positioned at the metaphase plate rather than individual chromosomes like you see in mitosis. So that's a second difference. And a third big difference is the separation of homologs. So at anaphase one of meiosis, the duplicated chromosomes of each homologous pair are going to move towards opposite poles. All right. But the sister chromatids of each duplicated chromosome, they remain attached. In anaphase of mitosis, in contrast, those sister chromatids are what are separating. So that is the third big difference between mitosis and meiosis. And this summary is really awesome. I highly recommend that, you know, if you're watching this video and but time passes and you want to review, this is this this graphic right here is the best way to re-familiarize yourself with this content. It just summarizes everything that we have discussed up to this point about meiosis beautifully and then contrasts it to mitosis. Now the last and final objective um, that we want to discuss here is genetic variation produced in sexual life cycles and how they contribute to evolution. So we've talked about crossing over already, how crossing over occurs during prophase one of meiosis and how it's a process where homologous chromosomes, they pair up and they exchange genetic material at specific points called the chiasmata. All right. Crossing over results in the recombination of alleles between non-sister chromatids of those homologous chromosomes and this exchange of genetic material between chromosomes, it generates a new combination of alleles and that contributes to genetic diversity in the offspring. But there's other things that also contribute to, to genetic variability and variety, right? In species that reproduce sexually, the behavior of chromosomes during meiosis and fertilization is responsible for most of the variation that arises in each generation. And on top of crossing over things, mechanisms that contribute to genetic variation um, that arise during sexual reproduction are things like independent assortment of chromosomes or random fertilization. So I want to quickly um, cover a few of those things. So an independent assortment of chromosomes. All right, I'm going to explain it, give you like a definition, and then we're going to break it down. All right. So during meiosis, Homologous chromosomes, they line up randomly at that cell's equator during metaphase one. Now, as a result, the arrangement and the separation of chromosomes during anaphase one will then be random. This random alignment and separation leads to different combinations of maternal and paternal chromosomes in those resulting gametes. So independent assortment then generates genetic variation by pretty much shuffling and distributing different combinations of genes from two parents into the offspring. All right. So let's think about this. Imagine you have a pair of shoes. All right. You have one blue shoe and one red shoe. All right. One blue shoe, one red shoe. And then you have two pairs of socks. You have one pair of socks. One sock is striped. All right, let's draw a striped sock. And your other sock is dotted. All right, so you have blue shoe, red shoe, striped sock, dotted sock. All right, now if you were to pack one shoe and one sock into a box without caring which shoe or sock you choose, there's going to be a total of four possibilities. You can have blue shoe with striped socks or blue shoe with dotted socks, or you can have red shoe with a striped sock or red shoe with dotted sock. This is essentially what happens when chromosomes pair, when, when this is essentially what happens with chromosomes during the formation of gametes. Each pair of chromosomes, like a pair of shoes or socks, are going to separate independently from the other pair. And that's going to lead to different combinations in the gametes. All right. So in the end, just like how you can end up with a red shoe and a dotted sock, a new cell can end up with any combination of chrom chromosomes from its parent cells. And you can see how that gives rise 
to genetic variation. All right, we've covered crossing over, but one more thing is random fertilization. Random fertilization refers to the chance encounter between gametes during fertilization. So each gamete carries a unique combination of genes resulting from that independent assortment and crossing over we've talked about so far. Then when two gametes fuse during fertilization, that specific combination of genetic material from each parent contributes to the genetic diversity of the offspring. And the random fusion of gametes pretty much ensures that each individual individual has a unique genetic makeup different from both parents. All right, so the takeaway points from our last objective, all right, is there's three events that lead to genetic variation, crossing over, independent assortment of chromosomes, and random fertilization. I hope this was helpful. That's all I have for you for chapter 13. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day.